Yeah. Yeah. All white? You, you have, have the hat on too. Just for you. Just for you. No, I knew you were going to be so good. Michael Chiesa, about to sit down with Luke Thomas. What's up, man? Look at this guy. Nice to see you. Good to How see you, buddy. How are you? What's going on, brother? Good to see you. My brother, good to see you, dude. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to this this interview. I'm looking forward to sitting down and chopping it up. The ashtray for his juice flute is like a really nice yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to get real, real interesting. Too. Oh, yeah. Which I'm, like, I'm, like, I don't I'm know which from the Pacific like. Northwest. That's all you? It's IPAs all day. There's also high noon that are watermelon or pineapple. What, what is a high noon? There's so many beds. Oh, that's like, exactly. Yeah. On and, uh, <laughs> He's from the great Northwest. He's a UFC welterweight. He loves chocolate hummus. <laughs> but despite all those factors, we love him just the same. Welcome to Room Service Diaries. Luke Thomas, Brian Campbell, and the guest of the hour, the one and only Michael Chiesa. Round of applause oh, for Michael Chiesa, Thank you, Thank you, thank you. It's you know what, here. Mike the Mev, real talk, real talk. When yeah. we pitched the idea of this show, and yeah. this is the first time we're taking it on the road, we're happy to be in Vegas, but our short list of guests of anybody was like, we gotta get this guy because yes, you were on the short list. Because he's one of us. Now, in the end, that's an insult because we're absolute pieces of shit. But he's one oh, of yes. us, all right? I'm one of the. I'm one of. Uh, I'm one of. Uh, I'm a fine. I'm a fine fan of being a degenerate. So, Thank gentlemen, you. Thank yes, you, sir. welcome, Thank you. welcome. I cheers you. I can't drink alcohol right now, no. but uh, I appreciate you being here. So, you're in town. Real quickly, are you doing some desk work for UFC? Yeah, I worked the Sharukian uh, Gamrot main event, which, by it's the way, phenomenal. was freaking the best what fight. What a fun-ass, amazing fight. That's the future of mixed martial arts. Like yes. that, that fight we saw in itself, and I'm sure we're going to unpack that at any point in time. But yeah, I did work the fights uh, last weekend, and I figured I'd just stick around for International Fight Week. So, How did you I, get that gig? Um, I, there was a few moments where I think I, I, there's, I, think I had a post-fight speech where I said something, and then I kind of just started chirping about it. I think I did a few interviews and talked about it. Um, I actually snatched Ariel's mic one time when he was doing like a, a backstage interview. I was like, give me your mic. And I started interviewing him. And then uh, I think DC, it, he kind of had something to do with it. He, mm. he took me to a dinner with, and sat me next to Zach, the guy in charge of the hiring. Zach Candido. Yeah, yeah, sat me next to him. And he's like, hey, do you know who that is? I go, yeah, that's Zach. He goes, no, that's the guy. That's the guy. And yeah. I'm like, dude, just got him. I worked with Zach at ESPN a long <laughs> yeah. time ago. Shout Did you really? Zach. Oh, yeah. He was the... He was, you remember ESPN's MMA Live, yeah. which, which had an impact, right? Yeah. John Anik, uh, you know, yeah. Rashad Evans. He was the producer of that show, and I was sort of one of the, like, editors who would see the final product and critique any any issues. But uh, that show launched so many careers, so shout out to Zach there. Yeah. But, uh, about your broadcasting work, I, I did want to start there, because you're already making a very nice transition, even though you're in the midst, you know, of, of the yeah. prime of your career. How do you gauge yourself? Now, we, we say on record, we like your work a lot on yeah. camera, but... I know this game as well, and how confident are you when you put on the suit and sit there in terms of what you're putting on? It took some time, honestly. It took a lot of time because you have to figure out what you're trying to do. Like, when for me, you know, I eat, sleep, and breathe mixed martial arts. This is all I do. So when I have to break a fight down, dude, I have a list of a ton of things, X's, O's, intangibles, all sorts of stuff, and I can't express all of that. So it took me time to figure out, like, hey, you got to pull just a couple things, and stick to those points because when it when I would get oh, I would overwhelm myself and they're in your ear and I don't I didn't understand terminology of rap layout all this stuff and so I'm you know Jack John I'm like you gotta rap rap stop talking I'm like oh yeah <laughs> shoot <laughs> so once I kind of figured that out and got comfortable man it's been a fun transition and it's so it's very convenient when you're out here like we're you know 80 percent of my shows are at the apex. So it, it doesn't disrupt training. It doesn't yeah. disrupt, you know, what, what's ultimately the most important thing, which is my, my competitive career. But, I mean, I just come out and basically work a desk show and train. I mean, it's a good head. advertisement, too. You yeah, know? you know, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I'm glad the pieces came together for it. You know, my manager had a big part in that, too. So Shout out to Danny Rube. Shout out to Danny Rube. Really? really? He had a heart part in that, did he? Yeah, I mean, he's... That's, I'm skeptical he, hippo eyes He has, here. you know, he, he, no, he, he knows what I want. He, you know, him and DC are buddies. And so he kind of, I think he did a good job kind of kind of plant the seed for me and it just I had to just kind of find those opportunities when uh, you're brushing shoulders with the right people and try to make an impression and do you do you want to do commentary yes I will be I will be a, a UFC octagon side commentator 100% that's and what that's the goal that that is like yeah that's always been the goal for me like you know I don't want to just be a UFC champion like I, I put everything into this sport and it's like so I want this is all I want to do you know yeah. and and I've been blessed that I'm I, my trajectory is headed that way so 
it just comes in due time because commentating takes so much work. Like when fans bust, People have, the fans when have they no when they bust blue. their balls, it drives me up the wall because these guys prepare so much. Like just to do a desk show where you're only highlighting a few fights, where I just have a, you know a few thirty second B rolls to talk over and a few an open discussion just like this. That's easy. But to be there to have your facts in the back of your mind written down in front of you to For know sure. their opponents, how they won. And just to have the, the knowledge to be able to broadcast, to be ultimately be the narrator of these fights, it takes so much work. So I hate it when people bust their balls. And for me, if that call came now, I'd jump on it. But I'm not pushing for it like I was because that, that is when you really you, – I, I don't even know how DC did it. For him to be a, a commentator yeah. while he was competing – in everything else he well, does. Well, according to Dom Cruz, it, the reason why is because he doesn't watch film. So it's yeah. You know, also, <laughs> we don't yeah. do the same kind of work, but when me and BC roll to the desk, we're, it's, it's usually on a fair amount of edibles. So we just got to wing it on there. <laughs> that, that makes preparation a little bit easier. I, I will say, though, that like the one thing I have about MMA commentary, and it's not specific to anyone in particular, because this is just true across the board. Dude, MMA commentary, it's all sports commentary is hard. Yeah. But baseball gives you a little bit of time to like work into it, and you can weave a narrative, and you're not like on the gun about what you have to do all the time. Of course, I'm sure I'm wrong about some things, but MMA, like, dude, you miss so much until you have a chance to kind of review it and think about it, and so have to react quickly to what you're seeing every time and getting it right. It's not that easy, actually. Not to mention, if you're sitting down calling a fight, so I do commentary for LFA. That's kind of where between the desk work and getting my reps. Thanks to Ed Soros, uh, you know, he gave me a shot to be on their commentary And those, team. those reps you're getting there, by the way, are going to be the most invaluable thing <laughs> to get you to that next level. It's true. <laughs> yeah, but it's good to get comfortable. But it's true, it's, when you're watching a fight, it's hard to stay just staring at the fight where you're talking. Like, you want to make a point, turn to the guy. Right. And in this sport, it's not like baseball. You hear a, you know, a guy hit a baseball, you can turn real quick. You don't know what's going to happen. I can For turn sure. to say one word, and in a flash, a fight could be over, and you can miss it. Even Paul and I were talking on UFC Roundup. Shout out to UFC Roundup. If anybody has a list of mine and Paul Felder's podcast, you want to check it out. It's great stuff. <laughs> Sorry, I'm advertising on your God, show. God, you suck. <laughs> Get the fuck out. <laughs> I told you I was a degenerate. This is what I do. Um, but, uh, you know, he even said he didn't even know in the moment that Gamrot got dropped to the spinning back fist. On round four. Yeah, right. because he was like in the, he was in the midst of a conversation. I was wondering why the booth didn't really react to it. I'm I, like, think, I think there was the angle. I mean, obviously, they're very, in that fight, I mean, they're firing on all cylinders. But it's like, you went, just like you said, you're making a point or an angle. Like, you, you, it's hard to kind of... Like a baseball game, you're up high. A football game, you're up high. Like you can see everything as it's happening. A fight, you can miss it because of a fence post. You can miss it because of a just a ref. You know, miss it try, trying to make a point. So, but yeah, things happen so fast when you're octagon side. It's crazy. How are the checks? For yeah, they're good. Yeah, I can't complain. I'm I'm fine. You're so full, of, dude. They're I'm great. Not, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're great. It's good. It's nice. You know, it's like when TV uh, money is stupid money. It it is. It's but it's like uh, you got to keep it humble. You know what yeah, I mean? It's, it's this is not. It's as much as I want to say it's a career because I've been I've been in the UFC for ten years. I've been at this for fourteen years. I do believe it is an opportunity. So especially in these instances where you're working television. The UFC could sell to, a, a, you know, they could go from ESPN back to Fox and they might just be like, we're done with these guys. And that would be out of the UFC's hands, maybe. You know, you, are you, do you know how much, and I, the answer is, I, yeah. I don't have any idea. Yeah. Do, you, do you know how much Rogan makes? I have no idea. Why are you obsessed with what Rogan makes? <laughs> I know. Well, dude, because, I, because, that, because, dude, it doesn't get much higher than that. I'm more right? obsessed with the exact height. I'm going to go 5'3". <laughs> no, he's taller than that. He's probably about as, as tall as Rube. I'd say they're around the same height. But he, so 5'4". <laughs> <laughs> We're roasting. He's giving us the middle fingers. He's like, yo, I wrestled at Oklahoma. He'll double leg this shit, all right? When did you start working with him? Uh, you know what? I started working with Danny. It was pretty, it was around the time, I think, I think our first fight was Benil. Benil was our first fight. So Danny, I met Danny on the road. Um, so yeah, I just met him in passing because he was at a lot of UFC events. And I didn't have any friends then, but I saw this guy there all the time. So I kind of buddied up with him. And, and he port in the storm. I know and that he, we, yeah. we hit it off and he wasn't even, he was representing two guys, Matt Grice and Sun Sal. And I think Holtzman came in the mix at one point, but there was no Ruby sports and entertainment. There was no management group. It was just him doing this just for his buddies. And I was signed with a different agency and I was unhappy. And I, so I reached out to him and was like, I know you're not, you don't really manage guys, but I don't trust anybody in this business. You know, and I'm not saying that I feel the same now, you know, I'm good friends with a lot of the managers in this business, but at the time I didn't know anything. I only knew one and I was on the outs with them. Um, and I just asked him, I was like, we just, I trust you, dude. And to this day, it's like, it's, it's, it's a, 
we we have we have our friendship and that's what kind of forged the business relationship but that still will always come first. Yo, Danny's my favorite because he won't stab you in the back but he will stab you in the face. Yes, he will. That. <laughs> that, 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 that's <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, and I that's tough. I don't know Danny's background but you know, we have this thing like people hate people that do the Irish exit. That's why I do the Lithuanian exit because you tell them in advance I'm leaving you. I'm getting up. I no longer want to This is his way here, of okay? saying by the time the edibles have kicked in. <laughs> oh, he, just such leaves, an asshole. he just leaves the dinner. Uh, I, we could talk to you about a million things but yeah. when people hear Michael Kies so they think Spokane, Washington. Yeah. In fact, you probably got some crazy fans. We got crazy fans at Morning Combat, and we did a live show a year ago from now in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and it was Luke and I drinking out of shoes. It was intense. These people are crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was One stupid. guy drove, shout out to Aaron, from Spokane, Washington. Yeah, he goes, Edgar, Edgar Meats. I know you're talking about. You know who the guy I'm talking about. Yeah, I think okay, if it's Aaron, wait, I'm thinking of... shit, you know this you guy. Know Aaron, let me see if you, if, what's his Twitter name? I don't well, know. we're about to show. If you could slip in this earbud yep, to hear it. Got it. Let's go back to when we met Aaron from Spokane last summer. Yeah, hey, Spokane. Luke's want to remind you that I was the giver and you were the receiver of the sausage. Yeah, that's from uh, yeah. Spokane, Washington, Mike Chiesa. That's, that's pretty much in Gonzaga. That's all we got. <laughs> we don't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, shout out to our boy Aaron, who yeah. ran that lit land Jaeger across the country like it was uh, smoking Bro. the bandit. Put it in Luke's hand. Just weigh whether or not that man uh, inflicted his own sauce into it to make <laughs> bad product. Luke did eat it, and he loved it. But one thing he echoed on, Aaron did, that's all we got in Spokane. It's basically yeah. land Jaeger and Kiesa. That's Dude, it. That's all we got. I, I met Aaron, so he owns Eggers Meats in Spokane. Great meat block. Great butcher block. Um, oh, so this guy's legit, Luke. Yeah, this guy's legit. Yeah, we yeah. just thought he... The, we, the okay, team so, goes so to... I, a, he's got a... He, we go out there to his I place had to get the, steaks I had some of the land Jaeger because I was so hungry and it was tasty. But it was just a dude who showed up and had a bag of meat, and I was like, <laughs> he definitely ejaculated. He's a right? huge, he's a no, he's a huge fight, man. He's got a con he's got a condo around here somewhere, but I met him when I worked at Budweiser. You worked at Budweiser? I worked at Budweiser. <coughs> Tell dude. us this story. Yeah. I, How I, old were you? I'm full of stories. This is a Spokane story. Uh, this is when I was 20, about 21 to 24. It's my last job before. So I, you were a piece of shit just like me. I was yeah, still dude. working. Slanging at 27, dude, I was still working in a factory. Yeah. I'm not kidding. It was, it's a true fact. <laughs> you, you're dub T just like us, bro. I used, to, I used to, when I worked at Bud, dude, I used to get so turned every day of the summer. <laughs> I would go home at night and I would put on my work uniform, my Bud uniform, my shorts and my Bud shirt. And I would just sleep on my couch. I'd go to bed at like two in the morning in my uniform. And you gotta be up at five if you're slanging cases. So I'd be like, boom, shoot up off the couch at five, go right to work. But okay. that's how I met Aaron is uh, when I was slanging beers. He just, he was, so he was kind of there like when I was on my way out. So like, did, you, did you deliver beer? I, I, was a, I was a merchandiser. So they dropped the beers off at the store and I just stocked the shelves, built displays. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, the, yeah. Great job for did you get Did you get like product for free? Or uh, we didn't, actually we didn't get product for free, but when it came down to company functions, you, they, you got your fill. Like oh, yeah. Cinco de Mayo and St. Patrick's Day when you work for an Anheuser Busch distributor. Is. I feel like a lot of young dudes in their 20s want to work in the alcohol industry. I used to work <laughs> in do. bars. It, 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 after a time, you're like, this ain't that money. It Dude, that well, and at the time, I'm such a fanboy. It was cool because it's like I'm working at the Anheuser-Busch plant and all this Bud Light UFC merchandise is coming through. Not so bad. you come in my house and it just looks like a, you know, just like a toy. I want to talk some drunk stories, but to yeah, this point. Yeah, I got plenty well, of Well, I was going to say, you know. My my, most, I, I have starting, a famous one that I'm sure everybody knows yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. I got a fledgling, you know, promotion <laughs> slash gym I'm starting called Factory Town MMA. And, you know, Mike Yessa could have been like the poster boy. Yeah, yeah he really could have. Yeah. What is Spokane like? I've actually never been. Dude, Spokane's great. It's, um, we're on the east side of Washington State, so um, it's very conservative. So you think Washington and you think it's, you know, and I'm not a political guy, but I'm just saying I think people, rainforest... people think Seattle when they, when I, when I right. say Spokane, they think Seattle. Yeah. No, it's the opposite. The weather's the opposite. The people are the opposite. The so you live the in the desert part of Washington? No, I live like on the east side. The desert would be like Yakima. Like How many times have you ever picked like a tick off your back or some shit? I fucking just picked, I, pick, I just picked three ticks off my dog like the other day. Yeah. Know? Yeah. No, I haven't got one on me yet though. But like, is it, uh, like how representative of Spokane would you say you are for someone who's never been? Yeah, you know, I'm, I, yeah, that's a, that's a fair assessment. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely resemble Spokane unless you're like a preppy college kid. I mean, you They're, looked even gnarlier to, to cut you <laughs> off. You looked even gnarlier a few years ago when you had that mini curl like mullet going oh, there was nothing, with that wasn't mini with that the thing full beard so luke he represents blue collar gnarliness yeah give him, give him his flowers i remember that one of the media days which one i forget who you were I fighting was it brooklyn maybe um the one which one did i show up in a flannel or yeah. the, the one i showed up in a fruity little fruity fruity oh my god and you had the shades too <laughs> dude, right dude that was bad that was i would not i'm that's one of the ones that was that like, late 20s kiesa that was just stupid kiesa that <laughs> yeah, was just yeah. me like i i don't even like saying my name in third person it was just like like stupidity at the time. I'm trying to be like 
talking shit to everybody, trying to stand out. And my teammate Sam was like, I never knew this. Cecilia. But after the fact, yeah, Cecilia was like, I cannot believe I fucking let you wear that out in public. <laughs> you, you you made me look like a total idiot. Oh, Sam and I dressed the same. It's like band t-shirts and flannels. We got know? a picture? Yes, yeah. that oh, was it. That was they it. They sucked. And in. I was delusional. I remember I asked you about it. You're like, yo, this shit rocks. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like I'm. I'm not. God, cool. I was a douchebag. Some I people would say I still am a douchebag, but I was definitely a douchebag then. I, I didn't have enough wherewithal Fuck. to know what was cool, but I definitely did, what, did one of these no, when you were there. No, that was bad. Yeah, Sam was like, dude, I you've made us both look what, terrible. Dude. Why did you, did your wife make you cut the hair, or your girlfriend at the time? Or no, I knew I'd have to sell out at some point to to yeah. move along in broadcasting, and I don't think I think I could grow my hair out now and be fine. But at some point, like if you're gonna if you're gonna if you want to play the part, you got to look the part too. The uh, the famous drunk story with Ally Quinta. How long ago was that now? Oh, the uh, the tough one yes. with the producers. Yeah. Oh man, it's been over ten years, and that was fucking wild. That's like I, that day is like when I forged my brotherhood with Al because he's such a rigid New York guy. Like, you know, if you ask someone to like stop doing something or quiet down with a New York person, it's like, yo, tune it the fuck down or something. Like, whoa, sorry guy, you know. But that day we finally became friends. Like he's a uh, that was fucking wild. It's crazy to look back on that too. He sold right. you a timeshare. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I, I, there's only one time. There, there'll only be one time share. It's on like the the bloopers of the DVD, yeah. which I'm surprised it made that because we got in deep shit for that. Did you really? I I was I got so drunk that day. Al, we got fined because like Al at some point like jumped in. So you know the, the, these guys know like the sound guys with a microphone. He jumped in the pool and so it like exploded in their ears. <sighs> and there was one guy. This one guy that was an audio guy was a total asshole to us the whole season. So we kind of were taunting him. He must have hated that job. Yeah. And so the producer Jamie came in. I was laying in bed. I was sick, and I had like an empty pitcher. I'm like laying on my little twin bed, flat on my back. And she comes running up the stairs. She's like, "You're in so much shit. We're, you're getting fined." Blah, blah blah. And I sat up and like was like, "I don't give a shit." Blah. And I like puked <laughs> in the pitcher. <laughs> Is that I, I, every time I ask a drunk story, I always need to yeah. know in reference where it stands. To what extent is that closest to your rock bottom story? That would be, that was like college kid type stuff. That was like, you know. That's some Junie Browning type shit right there. Okay? No, Junie Browning was a dick. Like, we were like just having good fun. You know what I mean? But I, I don't know if I have like a bad rock bottom drunk story. I think probably. You have like. If a, there is one, I probably don't remember it, which is probably good. No, I've got some. I've got some. <laughs> I've got some. I got some real rock bottom ones. Are you talking about like shit in your pants, rock bottom? No, I don't. Low. I don't have a shit or pistol oh, pants. Oh, I do have a rock bottom one. Okay, let me. Talk, I can't. Okay, you go I, first then. I can't. This is still to this day. There is a man that works. Let me. Let me. Let me ash my vape <laughs> before I've you get going. I've been waiting for you to that thing smolder this whole time. Uh, <laughs> UFC Guayana. I went there after I fought Brazil. Colton. Yeah, I went there after I fought Colton Smith. I went out with Cristiano Marcelo and got pretty the black belt. Yeah. yeah, got pretty tuned up and uh, I woke up in somebody else's hotel room and I had vomited and I woke up and was like, "Where the fuck am I?" like kind of got mad at the guy. And this is this is somebody that used to work in MMA media. A prominent guy. Oh, no, no, it's not. Yeah. No, my God, you yes. said it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. They can bleep it out if they need oh, to. Oh, no, it's yeah. I don't care at this point. This is so long ago. Like, yeah. and it was not my fault. Like, I got tuned up, and they, I went in the cab and fell asleep, and so they knew what hotel I was in. And his last, dude, you're name, lucky nothing bad happened, bro. Well, I was in good hands because uh, one of the UFC employees had kind of came out and kind of guided me home. Okay, you know? okay. So I think she was in like the cab ahead of me or something. So yeah, yeah. Mine's so. not quite like that. My rock bottom. I used to live in New York, and um, I remember we went out one night too. You ever been? You've been to, like drinking in New York City at all? Like. Not too much, That's where, no. There's a famous place. I don't know if it's still around, but it's called Hogs and Heifers. Oh, it's shit. where, like, Coyote Ugly is kind of based off of because you go in there and there's, like, bras on the ceiling and everywhere, but it's all biker bar. And we got drunk as shit. And, like, we lost one of our friends. We, you know, it was a whole thing. But I remember, I don't remember the night, and the only thing I remember the next morning is hearing a walkie-talkie, and then I got poked with a nightstick. Oh, my God. And my face is, like, really hurting because it's laying on a doormat. And uh, we tried to go into my friend's place, and I was sleeping on his doormat, and my friend was sleeping right in front of the elevator. So people had to, like, step <laughs> over him. And so they called the cops on us. Yeah. And the cops yeah. are like, but my buddy had lost his ID, so they're like, how the fuck did you get in here? And we're like, oh, well, we live right here. We're like, we'll open the door. Like, funny story. Uh, we don't have the key. And then we called our other friend who we had lost, and he had fallen asleep on the subway he woke up in Corona, Queens, and uh, on the phone, we just had a moment. With he goes, Corona. Probably. With, probably Corona. with yeah. Corona. And he goes, uh, hey, man, is, um, is this rock bottom? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's, it's pretty fucking close. 
Yeah, I, th I think that uh, our stories are similar because it just involves somebody being somewhere that they weren't intended to be. I mean, BC, shit. you got some crazy ones? I'm sure you got Yeah, a few. but it, you know, it ends up with me throwing up on a nude girl. And like, just, you know, just, <laughs> oh, you know, shit. Oh, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to do stuff like that. Yeah, you know, that's cool. Yeah. So wait, so Sam Cecilia is, that's an Italian name. Yeah, very. Kies is an Italian name. Yeah. There are a bunch of Italians in Spokane, Washington? Dude, what's crazy is down the street from my house, there's a, a restaurant called Comolini's, and it's famous because Al Capone actually hit out there back in the day. So there's a little area called Hilliard in Spokane, which actually used to kind of be like the little refugee for Italians from that era. And Comolini's was made as like a hideout, because before, I kind of live in the back sticks a little bit, like on the edge of town. But prior to that, it was like totally wooded and it was just like this cabin. It was just this little Italian restaurant for these wise guys, I guess. But yeah, Capone. It's like if you walk in there, it's part of their little history of Comolini. That's there. cool. Yeah, so I live like a mile down the street. Which how is how close is your closest neighbor on either side? They're fairly close. I'm on like five acres, but I can see their houses, you know, but I couldn't live with anything less. You got yard animals? No, I just got two dogs and fucking bats. I got fucking bats everywhere. There's bat. You, wait, you raise them or they're no, just there? No, fuck no. I hate yeah, bats. raising bats. Would I hate be bats. The, I, 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 that would be the weirdest. The thing only you reason I'm saying couch. bats is because it's summertime and I'm having to deal with them. Like if we were having this talk in the winter, and you'd be like, "Do you have pets?" I'm like, "No, just two dogs." But since it's summer and I can hear those little fucking things yeah. creeping around, they wait, make weird. Wait, correct me if I'm wrong. I interviewed you years ago. Did you not build a log cabin or some shit? I bought a log cabin. You bought a log. Still cabin. living it. Yeah. How was how, what's it like living in a log cabin? It's the same, right? You got insulation and shit. It's it, no, it's it's actually naturally it insulates itself. It's crazy. The only spot where you lose a little bit of the heat or the cooling is just from like the the joint. They're the joists because you got you got AC window units. Or you got central. Oh uh, yeah, I got a nice central unit. Okay, for sure. I was gonna say you dubbed T as shit. Yeah. And you got the, the window. The you're the no. most <laughs> you, Johnny Hendricks, and Brock Lesnar are the most American fighters of all time, right? <laughs> I do want animals though, dude. I want like a donkey, you know, and like a goat. I want to raise a Highland cow and like not butcher it. Just have a pet cow, like. Imagine if you pulled up to someone's house and they're yeah, that's their weird, dude. No, like, that's weird. That's pretty weird. That's fucking honest. sick. You've seen? Weird. I mean, my sister tried that bit for a while where they <laughs> yeah. people like raise chickens in their yard. They're like, yeah. oh, we have fresh eggs every day. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you got fucking chickens rolling around your fucking joint. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> no kidding, dude. My neighbors have what a in city the city. Boy. You can't I mean, have you roosters. Wanna... Oh, you got chickens there, tough guy. You can barely mow your yard. You have a riding mower. Well, that's because I broke. The, that's because I broke the riding mower. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Have you ever lived next to someone with a rooster? Have I lived next to someone with a rooster? Fucking no. In, probably because you guys live in the city. It's You're not supposed to have a rooster in city ordinance in most cities. Since I'm right on the edge of town, my neighbor's got like fucking five of them. There's nothing worse coming home from... Yo, I'm calling the cops. There's nothing me. worse than coming home from a rough night and you're trying to go to bed and the fucking rooster and starts... And there's cocks going. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, is that, is cocks like everywhere. It's like college. Right? He's you know? five years old. I don't know if I told you that. That's who he is right here. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about him as a fighter as well, Luke. Well, and, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to get to know him. And a very, <laughs> a very interesting fighter. Not only because he arguably has the best tattoos in the game, which Luke they are pretty it good. matters Thank to you. Luke Thomas. Okay, they are pretty good. it's like him and Josh Emmett atop that do mountain. You, do you, you have know? like one guy you go to, or now I do? Yeah, I'm gonna branch out, but yeah, I stick to my one guy. Like he's he's a good friend. Yeah, of mine. but do you good feel on. like you might have the best tats in the game? Do you walk around like Sean like, with that BDE? Good tattoos too. Sean, it does, and, and he's I like his commitment to knowing what all those things are because there's a, in this day and age, especially in the fighting world, some dude will have a fucking Koi fish, like what's that mean? They're like, yeah, strength. This koi fish, is like Brock. What, strength. Like, Brock, Sean what's that Brady, sword? His body <laughs> tattoos probably tell a story. He could tell you why each one's there and why yeah, it's yeah. a purpose. Like, I'm biased. I think I have the best because I'm not. I'm not into Japanese stuff like that. That's cool. I'm not against it. But I have a fucking Sasquatch on my arm, which is 100% Pacific Northwest. That's badass. That's with a time. fucking abominable snowman on my thigh. Like, those are my, I guess those are my dragons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. This is my dragon. This is my samurai. I don't fucking know. They make you pay for them? Um, he did this one for free because I, I put together a shadow box with some signed gear for his son's ski team. Um, and then I paid for this one. And I'm paying for it dearly because have you ever had your ass cheek tattooed? Oh, Thank that's you! That's his dream yes. of life! Yes. That's his dream this <laughs> dirt so the, hole. So the answer is no, not yet. But oh. the, the that's the plan. That's he the sends plan. me a picture of male ass so all the damn not, time on So text. mine's not full cheek, but like my, so my Yeti comes up like, you know, fuck it. If we're going to get yeah, let's see it. I mean, let's I don't know if, it. I mean, you know. Get naked. <laughs> Woo, I haven't even had a full beer. Um, Unfortunately, so you can this see where it comes like, up my cheek here. Yeah. So I only got like bottom cheek. Dude, I was like every every 10 minutes, I'm like, you got to give me a break. And he's like, no. It, like, you didn't use the numbing cream? It's Well, here's the problem. With the numbing cream, it makes your skin firmer. So when you're getting a lot of color, it won't absorb as well. Uh. So like... He'll, Can when, you get if he has to, uh, I feel like weed makes it worse. Yeah, I wouldn't I mean, do you that. can't drink. I feel like it, tattoos are meant to like you gotta just hunker down. You gotta be a real and man. Just deal with it. Like 
I just this is the only I one eat. I've ever gotten that was with uh, tattoo cream. Other than that, I've had see, yeah. All so natural. like when you when you pack on a lot of color, like they they shade over a lot of raw skin. So once he kind of pounds in the ink, that's like the I don't know the darker stuff. He'll put some cream on to get me through. Cause it's like imagine getting to explain for people with tattoos. Imagine getting road rash. Okay, and then you go home and instead of putting a banding on it, you start scratching it. Yeah, a little bit. You scratch it some more. It's yeah. like it's not fun. It's liquid fire, is what I tell oh, people. Getting it, it's liquid fire. You know, did you see Andy Ruiz, the boxer? Yeah. So he got all black and gray work, and then he was complaining to Canelo in Spanish that because he got his whole ass done, the yeah. whole joint. Oh. And he no, was he like, basically got the anus too. Like he yeah. Went, he so he was for it. his literal complaint was that it was hard to wipe his ass because it hurt from, oh, the, all, from all the tattooing. See, that's not good. That's not good at Yeah, I'm not all. here for ass tats mm. on anyone. Thank you very much. What is your take on the most controversial tattoo debate that we've ever had on Morning Combat Which here? Is? That, you know, good old father of the year candidate, Mr. Hebas, when Amanda got her UFC debut and she got a win by choking out Spitfire Whitmire, yeah. dad got the tattoo of that moment on his forearm, dad and coach, for the rest of his life. And I showed it to Luke and have you seen this shit? Just trying to celebrate, you know, like like the the late Kobe Bryant, he's a girl, hashtag girl dad, right? Okay, yeah. what are you doing? You're so awful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got a good, I got, I got, yeah. I got, okay. He's like, like this dead person that was famous once. <laughs> what I'm saying is, could you overlook the fact that maybe it's not the highest quality technical work just because so this man loves here's his the daughter? Thing. I all admire right? I, this V is for my daughter, so yeah. I, I understand that. It's a little banged up. It's a little banged up. That's like if you're gonna get that tattoo, like it's you the, can't the, cheat gest, on the it. gesture counts, but like you gotta go see someone good to get a portrait of one face alone is tough. Yes, but to get three of them in a yeah, that's it's it's, it's that's gonna cut. That, yeah. well, I, I I admire the gesture, but I think that that's gonna turn into. Are a you lot. gonna have kids? Oh man, I get that question a lot these days. Yeah, mid thirties, yeah, yeah, bro. They're still I know, yeah, usually I from know. your your elderly female relatives, not from a, a man. You know? Everybody thinks we're nuts. We don't want kids. Yeah, that's a fair point. We don't want, <laughs> we don't want kids. It's just not in the. No. I, I just, dude, I'm like, I'm so involved with this. Like, if I've gone this long. Even without, even the wife doesn't want them. No. She, we're very career focused. We're very career driven. And as wild as I am, that like, means you must have awesome dogs. Then my fucking oh fuck yeah, dude. Stone my dog. I have a dog named Stone Cold. After oh that's pretty bad. Yeah. Do you stunner him all the time? <laughs> no, but he stuns me with his fucking fat ass. He's forty pounds. He stuns me with his little obese round body. And then I got a big uh, King Corso blue. Oh, so. did, did you buy from like a breeder? Uh, He's gonna uh, judge my, my wife did before. He's gonna judge your ass now. Yeah, I know mutts are cool. I grew up with mutts. Yeah. I got a couple from the pound, bro. Did you? From yeah. the mean streets? Yeah, I got one. Because that's where we came from in life. <laughs> from the dog shelter? <laughs> I don't know if we came from the dog Jake, shelter. Jake, the camera guy, has been to my hometown. Got, it's close I got, enough. I got picked up by the Humane Society. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, that's the dog. Look at him. Someone tattooed him. Let's talk about your career a little bit. Where yeah. are you in terms of your existing fight contract? How many fights you got left on it? That's a I just recently, yeah, no. I asked Max Holloway about brain damage yesterday. I mean. Yeah, I guess that's fair, yeah. Uh, we were signed a new deal, yeah. Recently? So, yeah, recently. Uh, yeah, after the last fight, too. I'm happy with it. Very yeah. happy, yeah. Can't complain. Uh, so how many, okay, I'll ask this way. How many years do you think that would take to complete? Uh, it depends on my body. That That's the tricky thing for me. Um, are, you you know, super, when, are you super banged up? I'm not super banged up. I just have, you know, back in 2016, I dealt with that. Uh, I had a little back injury. Yeah. It was actually a big back injury that pulled me out of the Ferguson fight. So that kind of is coming back, kind of baring its teeth a little bit. So the biggest thing for me is, you know, I have to learn to, when you're young, you take more chances. You fight when you're injured. You kind of roll the dice a little more. When you get older, it's like, is this really, I got to make sure that I get this thing taken care of before I acquire another injury through a training camp. You're always going to go in there banged up. So but you also don't want to get to your moment and be hurt for it, right? Yeah, well, you're always going to be. I can't tell you a single fight that I have not gone into with some type of injury. Like, it's to the point where, like, if I haven't gotten hurt of, in some way that's significant in a fight camp, I'll get to fight week and I swear to God, I'll be panicking. I'll be like, something bad is going to happen when we're cutting weight or doing something stupid. I'm going to twist a finger. Like, I haven't gotten injured yet. Hmm. Fuck, it, you just always kind of expect it. Maybe that's bad. Maybe it's manifesting it. I don't know. But it, at this point, it's like, make sure your back is healthy. This is important. Like, I love, as much as I love and admire, I want the career. This is a perfect example. I want to have the career that Forrest Griffin had. Won the Ultimate Fighter won a UFC belt, hmm, has right. moved on, and he continues to work with the company. He's, he's a, basically he, an ambassador. He's a part of it, yes. Right? He's kind of an ambassador I for the game. I want that career, but I see the side effects of, like, just maintenance going into fights injured. Like, he's, you know, he, he left banged up, you know, yeah. and, and he'll talk about it openly all the time. So it's like, he, he'll even harp on me, stretch more. Dude, take care of your body. If you're injured, if your shoulder's fucked, take care of it. Don't, don't you know, 
Yeah, you don't, use, put use don't put band-aids on things that need stitches, basically. Just kind of really, if something's bad, get it fixed. So that's the biggest thing for me is making sure I'm healthy when I get back in How there. fucked up were you all those years trying to make lightweight? Like, what was the, I mean, I know there was losses attached to it when yeah. at the very end there. But, like, from a physical standpoint, can you describe at what point you were like, man, fuck this. This is not fucking worth it. It was, it was that last cut. Because for me, it's like, you just, I kind of, when I started MMA, it was like still kind of, I always called it the militant era. When I started training, it was like, Hard sparring yeah. every day. Hard weight cuts. Ten rounds, yeah. hard weight. Everything was very extreme. It's a very extreme sport. So I was still kind of riding that up until I started to kind of get a taste of getting older, having your bones get a little denser, having not being able to lose weight as easy as you as before. Like I used to leave for fight week and have cheesecake with my family before I'd go yeah. to fight week and still make weight. Is that smart? No. But that last cut for Pettis, man, I just, I came in too big. It was dealing with an injury and just like, you always kind of feel like you're walking to a very extreme situation. Like weight cut days always like, you really dread it more than, more than What anything. was the most you ever cut in a day? I, I always did good like. Day of or whatever? Day of, day of weigh-ins. I never really had big cuts, but I remember before I fought Joe Lozon and Mitch Clark, I had some real, and Jim Miller. I mean, and everybody <laughs> and every fight and every, every, every fight so, yeah. every fight's attached to some fucking bad weight cut story and shit even at 170 now it's like I, I only had one cut that didn't feel like a cut and it was the first one and now it's like it's yeah. not as it's not as bad but i'm just saying it's what's that your was, what's your weight right like at right the moment oh i'm proudly like 203 like wow like i can't grapple and spar but i'm going through a lot of like you know strength conditioning i'm still lifting weights i'm not gonna fucking i don't get these biceps sitting on the couch yeah the, thick, as i'm solid as i'm pushing them up yeah. a little bit. <laughs> but yeah so i'm doing what i can you know and i like maintaining size i think that that i think that that's another thing too is when you're when you're cutting weight all the time and putting yourself through it you acquire more I think my back problems I had came from there's no doubt. There's like no from doubt. training. There's nothing good from that training hard when I'm yeah. small. Like I'm trying to do power cleans and stuff while I'm trying to cut to 155 pounds. Like I feel like that. That's how my injury happened. Dude, you, you ever talked to Chris Levin about his weight cuts? No. Dude, he. I had him on my show. Uh, this is long after he'd retired, and he or maybe he'd come back for like the I think he did BKFC, BKFC or something. Yeah. And I had talked to him, and he told me he's on pills the rest of his life to regulate his endocrine system. Yeah. Because he fucked up everything so bad from weight cuts, his body can't regulate it anymore. See, and I'm glad I got out when I did. Because I feel like I was getting to that point. Like, the Pettis fight was like, I had, at that point, I had to be, everything had to be perfect to, come, to make weight. Like, you have to be, at this point, during fight week, you have to be injury-free. It's like, everything has to be. Does that mean go literally up. no cheat day? That would screw up everything? Well, before, there was a lot of cheat days. I was just young and stupid. But, yeah. like, as I started to get older, and more, like, most of all, I started falling in love with lifting weights. I never did before. You know, so I'm trying to get stronger and, and trying to get stronger, become a better athlete. But while I'm depleting myself, those two things passing by each other yeah. fucked me up. So I had the back injury, tried to come back, and I did against Kevin Lee. But I was like, I'll do no strength conditioning. I'll focus just on martial arts skills. And look what happened. It's like, no, if you're a grappler, if you want to be a power grappler, if you want to take guys down, if you want to dominate positions, get submissions, you can't be a skinny little bitch. <laughs> so in order for also, me to... Like to <laughs> also, like to lift weights, you do have to eat. Like you, yeah, you have to and I didn't, and, and I yeah. didn't understand that, you know? So it's you, like even a guy like Charles Oliveira, the greatest submission artist we've ever seen. His skills are really shining as he's like gone up in size. Like right. he kind of is a... I feel like as a grappler, you're always like, I need to be as big as I can in the lowest weight class because that's what's best for me because I want to take guys down and blanket them. You know what I mean? Like, but here's one of life's no, greatest No, it's not mysteries. true. It's better to be bigger. You went from being a big lightweight to being like the biggest welterweight. <laughs> yeah, like well, just yeah, overnight. That was the thing. It, wasn't, I mean? it wasn't like there was like, well, he's, oh, he, he's, he's okay for this weight class. Mm -hmm. I remember that Kimura you had on Condit. Yeah. Your fucking back looked like a turtle shell. I was like, whoa, where did this come from? It's crazy. Why? Well, it's, dude, from that, that was getting with a regiment. Like, I was kind of going renegade style, looking up YouTube workouts to do to lift weights. And, and I had a good guy kind of taking me through it, but I kind of went off on my own and coming to the PI, like getting in a regiment, like my body was like, if I'm going to do this with these guys, like you got to make a choice. And yeah, the Condit fight, I finally ballooned up. Like, got to take creatine. Creatine's like, I've, I can't believe I've gone this long in my life. It worked for McGuire, bro. I never, I never got to hit the creatine until I was like 30. I didn't even know. Dude, what really? It, well, I just was never at, like, you, at can't, 20 years you old, can't take it. You're yeah. going to get too big. So it's like, yeah. okay, No, at 20 years old, I was swallowing from. every pill at GNC <laughs> possible. Yeah. <laughs> How bad is that for your kidneys? Though? Did you ever have any moments where your kidneys just felt like they were just um, dried up and dead? 
No, I never had that. I mean, I'm not, you probably trained way harder than I ever did, so I never got to any points of extremity like that. But I, I, do, I, I, I was at GNC when they were like, still selling ephedrin. Oh, Remember ephedrin? Dude. It was killing baseball players. I was like, that's the one I want. No, it was killing records, old records. <laughs> Hold on, they're, uh, they want to offer you more beer. I'll do another beer. Do you want another beer? Yeah. You see, you want a beer? Uh, yeah, I think I threw my cup somewhere over here, though. If we can get one of the one of the gas. Hey, why don't you keep nursing that stupid red drink? <laughs> yeah, what is this? You thing? Know, it's, like, <laughs> it's like some mystery. It's, you took the label off. It's, like, uh, is, is this Paula Costa's juice? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a more low with We uh, should, we with should green make an energy drink, drink. Yeah. Paulo Costa. Well, this is how... Okay, it's I'm a, such an old piece good. of shit that this has green tea in it to keep me going during the show because we're all... Bro, let me explain <laughs> something to you about aging. Now, we get none of that for pro athletes. Yeah. But at, in the way you're at now, 35, feel about the same. 36, yep. you know, it, it, when you age in the way you're at right now in your 30s, yeah. it's arithmetic. Yeah. Buddy, at 40... It's exponential. You just hit it's the wall. Ex- yeah. it's, uh, I can't tell you how different it is. Like, I may dress like I have high tea, but I, I don't think I do at all, to be fair no, with you. Mike. No one thinks you have <laughs> high tea, just to be very clear about that. Dude, are, do you guys take, is, I don't mean to ask, I mean, if Luke's going to ask me how much fucking money I make, I'm going to yeah. ask, you know, do you yeah. guys take tests at all? Like, let's get personal. I'm thinking about it. I, dude. Yo, you talking about him cycling on a 2013 Mohawk Vitor style victory he's, he's run get, of life, bro? You know he, what I mean? He's gonna make a run at powerlifting. You're all no, no, I'm not. I, I don't want that. I just, I, I just don't want my back to hurt when I brush my teeth anymore. That's really, <laughs> that's my, that's my fitness goal. That'd be nice. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, that's. Uh, Have you thought about it? I mean, obviously you're fighting, so it's dude, not really yeah, relevant. Obviously I mean, you're a pro never, athlete, so this isn't something you think about. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, you know, I've been thinking about seeing a doctor. I mean, I mean, in know. the next chapter of your life. Oh, dude, absolutely. My body's gonna be so fucked. I mean, that's just the reality. Like, even if I stretch and do everything right, at some point I'm gonna. And it's not like I'm gonna wait till like this damn out of the USADA pool. It's like, no, it'll be like is once I start to fall apart and like I can't train and I can't do. I'm like, if I have a very physical lifestyle. You know, I like to grapple. I like jujitsu is a big passion of mine. I'll always do that. I like to snowboard. I like to do things like that. Once I, my body starts giving out on me, and I'm, I'm like, all right, well. Are you a less dangerous in terms of your own personal safety, Donald Cerrone? Oh, yeah, just, I was dude, gonna yeah, call I'm not even, I'm not Northwest even, Donald Cerrone. I'm, I'm just a little gonna bit. nail that. Look, yes. man, we, maybe we're slightly cut from the same cloth, but I couldn't snip that guy's jock strap. He's a fucking lunatic. Wow. That guy's fucking. His stories are insane. He did the he did a UFC, UFC countdown show in like. The five first five minutes they're filming, they had a camera guy in his brand new rapper and he fucking flipped it. Like the first five minutes. Like, dude, I don't sorry, know how. dude. I'm not even in that guy's ballpark. Like, but you ever seen the you know the, the Meow brothers in jujitsu? Yeah. You ever seen that famous picture? I don't know if it was Joan or Apollo, but you ever seen the picture of his hands? Yeah. They're... And the arthritis in the knuckles. Because those guys were big in gi. They did no gi too, but they were really big gi grippers. Yeah. If you guys have never seen it, the Google Meow, it's spelled M-I-Y-A-O. And you see his hands, and this is a picture they took in his mid to late twenties. No. And the arthritis is—you cannot believe it if you've never seen it. It's like having it. big pickles for fingers. Dude. They just look all big and bumpy, and I can't even. You, it's like, how do you still grip? It's like when you see an old jujitsu guy like a Carlson Gracie. He moves kind of slow. Yeah, dude, rigid. they limp. But when they get on the fucking mats, yeah. his hands look bad, dude. But I bet when he gets to grabbing. Yeah. I went to a Meow seminar, f- and I saw fuck. his hands, and I was like, what the fuck? But dude, then he would—he would just like. Get on the mats and, and roll, yeah. and it was like nothing ever That's happened. That's those OG jujitsu guys. Those guys are dude. old school cowboys, man. Those dude, they really are, are. Fucking real men, like like Marco Huis, real men, right? King of the streets. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, you're streets. you're entertaining. The, stop, the, the, just just the, stop, know. okay? Don't <laughs> just, just just don't be a bitch, all right? Um, Mike, when I you've 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 got a, actually a sneaky good resume, and I don't think people always realize when they put the clip. Like, I mean, you'd be fucking RDA, like yeah. they, like, and you still got it. Yeah, you've done you've done some really good things. But you also had that viral moment with oh. Kevin Lee. Oh, yeah. We're talking about, about my mom. Yeah, we're yeah. not going to talk people, about your mom today. So don't worry. Yeah, I was going to say, you're, you're lucky I had a beer too, because I would have perked right up. Like, fuck, here we go. People care about that. It yeah. was a moment. Did you ever have any doubt that you were going to just fucking go make that moment happen? I know. It, that was just, you know what? In hindsight, good old Kev, good on him for knowing how to get under my skin. Like, that's the one nerve you can strike. I'm a pretty cool-headed guy. And granted, lightning would not strike twice. It, it wouldn't matter. Somebody could go full chaos Covington mode and start saying some volatile shit and I'd keep my composure. But that was the first time I'd ever dealt with that. We're like, wow, someone said something that actually got under my skin. So I got to give Kev, he, he might say some stupid ass shit and I still think he's an idiot, but <laughs> I got to give him his kudos. He, he got me good with that one. Is that the only time you ever had an opponent who you were just like, man, fuck that guy? No, the crazy thing about Kevin is we actually trained a little. We were not like we worked together, but we were in the same room at Syndicate a few times. Um, so everything was like pretty cordial yeah. and passing and literally up until the press conference, like I saw him beforehand, I'm like, Hey, you know, handshake, walk away. So everything seemed fine. But the second the press conference started, I think we were both kind of raring to go. Like, 
like I said earlier, I was wanting to be a douchebag. Like I was like, I'm ready to get on the mic and start talking shit to guys. That's how I'm going to get to big fights. And that was like my first time trying to do it. And I attempted and I got like, I got 10 8 <laughs> He talked about my mom and I literally ran at him and got punched. <laughs> that's, the, that's the worst part, dude, is I literally ran at the guy. He was like, don't you talk about my mom. And I'm the, I'm the guy that got punched. I'm like, you fucking dumbass. Did you get love though in certain <laughs> circles for that? Are there moms that stop you on the street and they're like, thank you. Oh, man. dude, I'm a high school wrestling coach. So I'm around fucking cool ass wrestling moms all the time. And they were like, way to stand up for us moms. I'm like, fuck yeah, I'd do it again. I don't give a shit. And it's something like, when it happened, it like, I was like, oh, you know, it's not like my, one of my prouder moments, but like, as you get older, like you kind of, you kind of play into that role of those like comments. Like look at Poirier, he's like the king of it. When people throw shade at him, he's yeah. always like, he'll go with it himself. So now it's like, it's funny to me and I'm, I'm, I'm glad it happened. It's always funny. My mom on my 30th birthday got me a shirt made. He's like, don't you ever talk about my mom? No oh, way. We, took, we took a picture and then we, we, I sent it to Kevin, tagged him. I was like, hey, happy 30th birthday to me. You know, so I kind of play into it now. But he 10 to me, fucking beat me two to zero. The fight and the press conference. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's I know. A tough career. That's a fuck. All right, so but let's speak of which. So you, you you won two, and then yeah. the last two you've lost two. Yeah. Where 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 do you think you are? I mean, obviously you're still ranked. But yeah. Like, where where do you think you are in your career right now? Dude, I, dude, I'm one. I go out there. It doesn't matter who I fight. I go out there and beat anybody and, and show who I who I who I really am. Like, I mean, you were like a dark horse title candidate at yeah, the moment. I was ra- ra- Once you switched to sort of beating guys, four straight wins. Yeah. You know and. The, the Sean Brady fight's one I can hold my, my head high on. You know, like, nobody wanted to fight that guy. And, you know, I took on that challenge. And I don't – I, I feel like he legit beat me. But I wasn't – it's like uh, going through the fight, still staying in it, having my moment at the end, at the end of the third round. Like it's, You were he, like Valentino against Amanda in the oh, first fight. That's what you were he, like. He legit fight, right? beat me. That's the first time in my career where I just feel like, I, like he got me. You know, I didn't – every other fight I always feel like I beat myself. Like, I went into that fight – very active, you know, I, this is coming off, you know, the Magni fight, Luke a fight, Brady fight, three camps in a row, three camps where I'm healthy, feeling strong. He, I, he just, he got the best of me. But every other fight, it's always like, I beat myself. There's something I did to myself. Hmm. I mean, it's always something mental. It's always okay, been I the hit moments that. where something happened within, whether it's within the fight or just something, that's where it's always been. Because you were honest about that after the yeah. Luke loss. Because yeah. That Luke fight was the moment I thought you were coming yeah, on. Yeah. And there's still time and you're still yeah, coming well, on. I do, but, I'm not sweating those but last bro, two fights. But bro, my I'm point one is... Fight away from all this stuff, all the, the My last point is it looks so close. Washed away. Yeah. It looked like you were ready to seal it. Yeah. I liked your honesty afterwards. Yeah. What, what sort of happened in that moment? I think for me, this is the instance of beating myself. Is it's, not, it's not like I'm a mental midget. Like I've shown in my career, I'm one of the mentally toughest motherfuckers you'll ever see. Like it's, it's the times when I've... It's, mental choices I made within the fight that they've cost me like hey go for the finish like yeah. really trying to push that push on the gas kind of dealing with the stress of wanting to like put an emphatic finish on this win instead of like hey why don't you just go out there and beat the guy like you beat the last four you know do what you did before and, and I just kind of got away from myself wanting to like try to capitalize on a big moment you know if I if I went five and oh that night this would be a really interesting conversation because mm. at the time I was kind of in the mix to fight Kamaru just from word of mouth between him and Ali. Yeah. So it's like that could have got me into the dream spot. You, know, mm. the you spot. were the only one that hadn't fought him at that point. So I thought you could have yeah. potentially made a real leap and I, for the top. Yeah, you know, and just I made a, it was a, it was a bad mental decision on my yeah. part. You know, you're, you're in an interesting, uh, interesting spot at welterweight right now because you got a lot of guys that have kind of hung around for a little while. Yeah. Your Colby's, your Jorge's. Kamaru's obviously still the top, but that yeah. that cannot for anybody cannot last forever. No. And then you got a bunch of young guys: Shemaev, yeah. Rachmanov, Brady. Yeah. It's an interesting time in this division. Yeah. It seems like there's a new class starting to slowly uh, push the other ones out. People want to know which class are you in, the yeah, one that's exactly. going out or the one that's coming in. I'm, right, fucker. I'm right in the middle. I'm kind of. It, it is kind of a weird thing. I, I don't. I don't feel like the veteran, but it's like fuck. I have been here for ten years, and maybe it's good that I don't feel like the veteran. It's, I it's still, very, I good, still very much feel like a hungry up and comer like that. That I don't. I, I feel like it's like probably how Clay Guida feels. Like Clay Guida's. I've never heard him say at any point like. He's laying off the gas from not Absolutely. wanting to fight and get to a title, and he's still f- f- shit. He was on a good little streak himself recently. So, yeah, dude, it's it's. I've already hung in there with one of the best up and coming guys, if not the best. Sean's as good as it gets. What was it? What was it? Tell me what it was like fighting him, because I would. T- I, it was funny the way the fight played out. You actually had some success on the feet. Yeah. I thought that I, it was going to be. A, I didn't know how the ground was going to play out, but I thought. Yeah. I was surprised at how much success he had, and not, not anymore. Now that yeah. I realize, like, whoa, he's really, really he's good. He's fucking, he's gorilla strong. Like that was one oh, of those. Yeah? That was one of those instances where, like I said, I, I'm, I'll be as open about any of my fights, wins or losses. More importantly, the losses. Um, yeah, I just, I did not think that there would be a guy that would feel like that. 
Like, that guy has to be, he has to be the strongest guy at 170 pounds. That doesn't mean he's going to go out there and do the same thing to guys like Chimaev or Kamaru. Right. I'm just saying for that aspect of, of mixed martial arts skills or just skills in general, that guy is so fucking strong. We had him in studio, and he, it was, I was, he's, it's, it, the only other guy I've ever seen like this, you ever see Evander Holyfield in his prime? Yeah, like he, traps up where, to yes, here. Where just, they almost rotate forward yeah. by virtue of how muscular yeah. the guy, that's what he looked like in person. Dude, and it, you can, I mean, it, when you you know when someone's really strong when you look at their back. You'll yeah. never see somebody that's this fucking freakishly yes. strong that does not have big back muscles. You ever heard the They can have fucking skinny arms and legs, yeah. but if if you look and someone's got a big back, Ian Heinish has Jurassic back. Yeah. yeah, dude, it's the what did Matt Brown say? The front is for show, the back is for go. Yeah, right? dude, oh, right. it's, it's, yeah. it's like more cushion for the push. Yeah, it sounds like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's an LBB thing, Luke. You know, you know, yeah. It's like, but the Sean Brady fight felt good to have success on the feet, though. I will say this: that was one of those fights where I kind of knew going into it, this is the one. Let's pick at him on the feet, yeah. and and then kind of, kind of force him into trying to make those engagements, but not in a offensive way, like a defensive way. Let's pick at him until he's like, "Fuck, I'm done with this. I want to grapple now." Like, I give him praise for the win, of course. Yeah, but there are critical player. fans who feel like maybe you exposed him to a to a certain degree. Do you buy into that? That's tough to say. Like. Um, you broke his nose first right away. Yeah, and he know, told me he had to swallow blood, and it was like incredibly I, distracting. I mean, he I, fought through some shit. Believe I believe it, that, yeah. but I do, but I still I believe him in that sense. I broke my nose in an amateur fight before, and I know what it's like to have to fight when literally your blood is pooling up in your mouth and you're spitting it out. Like it's, yeah, I feel for that for that because I've been there, but I still don't think it would have changed anything. I still think I would have came on. It's fucking hard in a fight to ride to ride someone's back like that is not your body gets gassed out. Maybe not your lungs. It's your body just starts to kind of give out. Like, I, I've had fights where I've body triangled somewhere for 10 minutes and third round, I'm like, I'm, it's like I'm almost on chicken legs and I haven't even gotten punched, you know? So I still think the nose didn't make that big of a difference. Where, where do you think uh, Colby deserves to be ranked? I realize where he has been ranked. Yeah. But the big argument against him is the, the last relevant win was actually Jorge, who is certainly much, much, much older. Mm -hmm. And so, and honestly, who the hell knows what's going to happen with that whole shit between them yeah. and the court case. But do I'm not saying we don't take him seriously, but I do wonder to what extent do you think that there might be um, a bit of an inflated sense of where he actually is. That's a that's a that's a harsh reality he's going to have to face because he, the shtick doesn't really sell. You know, it's like for me, it's like you're not going to be able to use that and get yourself in any more bigger fights. You're going to have to now fight somebody that isn't has been in a pay per view main event that hasn't fought for a title. You're going to yeah. have to fight a guy like, or maybe, I mean, the only other one I could say would be like a Gilbert Burns. Like, why don't you fight Gilbert Burns? Yeah. He's He's been in a high profile fight. That's you not know, an and easy be, fight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah, it's good luck fighting that gorilla. Dude, yeah. yeah, fuck, yeah. That, him and Brady would be a fun fight. Um, but it's like, at some point, you have to realize, like, you're going to, if you want to keep competing, you're going to have to fight someone like me. You're going to have to fight someone like Bilal. You're going to have to right. fight somebody like Chimaev. You're going to have to fight somebody that's, not as marquee as these other guys, and I'm not. That's not saying. It, it, it's just a. It's just a harsh reality. Dude. I think Kobe should call out Jamayev. And while while we can say what we want about his chances in that fight, yeah, good fucking luck, dude. That's that's a that's a potential it's big high profile that's situation. Not what we're, that's not what we're here to do, though. Like we're not here to like that. If the, he's the only guy that that's actually a real scenario where you look at him and say, wow, that's. It's you want to shy it. away from that fight because he's so tough. Like a guy like me or Bilal, we're like or Brady's like. We don't care. That's the big. That's the hottest guy on the market right now. I want to fight that motherfucker. I like, mean, do you how, see? How is he not jumping to that? Like, you got to face the challenge. Well, if you, remember, if you want to maintain so, your spot yes. in the sport, yeah. if you want to maintain being Colby Covington, the guy at the top of the division. You got to up the ante. You got to fuck, and it was right in front of his face. He could have went and fought Shemaev, and even if you go out, as much as I think he's a fucking dork, and it, he's got me sitting up out of my fucking chair. Yeah. Uh, it's like the way he fights. He's a tough son of a bitch. Like you, he would go out there and give Chamaya fucking damn right, fit, and if dude, not beat him. So he, that's just a reality. And Chamaya could very well beat him, but I'm just saying, Colby should have taken that chance because if he's the first guy to hand him his loss, he's sitting on top for dude, a while. You just, you just, he puts you him down. It. Guess what? You 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 jump Leon, you jump everybody else, and you can sit atop where you think you are. For the next two or three years. There's a win and a loss in that fight if it goes that way for Colby. There's a win for taking that fight. And we know from interviewing Gilbert Burns, it became like the highest traffic thing we ever did. Dude. Because people were so in on, on Chamaya because he's glowing yeah. right now. You yeah, know? that's 
Our and biggest one's actually Floyd saying beating Connor is easy. Well, that's because Floyd <laughs> sent me to hell over that cr- remark I had about. He his did. Resume, Floyd did say this guy you. in Floyd's face challenged him about the weakness yeah. of his resume. Uh, you know what I what Floyd, I thought Floyd was I had lo- an opportunity. Floyd, Floyd didn't love that too. I much. had an opportunity to make magic on the mic and I knew it, so I went after it. All right, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You fucking went for it. That's, that's a, what I'm saying. That's a, you know, what is your uh, seriously? What is your proudest victory? Man, I would say. Uh, Yo, you can't be the RDA. That win was no, nice. No, it will dude. always that's a be. Good win. It's a no. It's a no. It'll always be the Ultimate Fighter finals. I mean, dude, that's my mom's birthday on the end was of that. It really, that's that cool. was my mom's birthday on the end of that run. I had dealing with the passing away of my dad and stuff. Yeah. Like that was like, I don't even think. And I still the ultimate goal is always win a world championship. But I really think that when it's all said and done after I do it and I compare the two moments. I, the Ultimate Fighter one will always be the best win. That was like, you can't beat that. I don't mean to... It's, pro- like, you, it's like a book was written, like, oh, your dad died, and now you're going to go fight on your mom's birthday. Yeah. Like It's yeah. like a Disney movie. Well, I fucking lived through it, and it was... That'll... For me and my family, that'll always be... Like a, I don't want like I don't want to pry, but I, I don't mind. When my, when my mother passed, it was yeah. sudden and tragic and unexpected. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a similar circumstance? No, my dad had cancer. So oh. before I actually didn't go, I almost pulled back on the Ultimate Fighter because I knew my time was limited. So I was like... Do I want to go through with this or do I want to be with my family? And he was just like, You gotta go do this. Like, I don't what care. A, so wow. I had this. So I literally wow. the last time I saw my dad was at the front door of the house and he was just like, This is it. Like, and then a week later he passed away. And you were on the show? I was on the show. I I I won my fight. That was to a get, gift I won my you. fight. I forgot to, about all I, of this. Yeah, I won God. my fight to get in the house, then my dad passed away the next day. Like at, like within hours of after my fight. Like oh, man. hinged on long enough to know I won. He Dude. didn't see it, but he was like but that's a but dad move. That's like a gift he gave. Yeah, the dad's supposed to do. So right? that's like, your final dude, moment, you know? I, I, when the day comes and I wake up in my hotel room with a world title sitting on my end table yeah. and I compare the moments, that'll never be beat. That's Forever. Amazing. That's like, that was huge for me. I gotta say, though, Dick, I wonder how the pressure feels to win now that you are in the commentary business a little bit. Like, you know, they obviously, I'm sure they're not going to be, it's not a question of, well, if you lose, yeah. you're out the door. But it can't be false that they don't want you guys to win in those roles. Oh, man, it, it, it makes the team look good, you know, but it's one of those things. It's, it's more, you shine through your performance. You shine through being, there's a lot of guys you could put up there with really high credentials. Like Daniel Cormier is one of the rare guys that has the cr- best credentials in the sport, but he can speak really well. No disrespect to Henry Cejudo, one of the greatest fighters we would ever see, but he would not be good on the mic at all. It's a little all. cringy. A little it would, watched, it just, it's not even the cringe. Eagle FC? And, uh, I'm on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Love Chael, though. Love Chael. Yeah, Chael's a, Henry, Chael's a born star. Handle, He's a born it's, star. He, it's not all about the, having the It's not about having the accolades. It's about performance. You get the opportunity, show that you can speak, and show that you analyze these fights and you take it serious, and most importantly, take yourself out of the equation. It's like you can't you can't assert yourself into this is what I would do or this is it's you give your just your your analysis with you outside of the equation and I think that's hard for some fighters because it's like it's always about how would I beat this guy especially when you're like doing things involving guys in your weight class. All right, all right, you can send me to hell for this, but but you're open enough that I want to ask you. Yeah, okay, I said go. before, you know, man, I'd love to see Colby call out Jamaev and do it now. What if someone said I'd love I'd love. I'd love uh, Michael Chiesa to call out Shavkat Rachmanov or someone like that and do that <laughs> right now. Manager. We're on the same management team. Yeah, that's not that's not the one for me. Why? Mm-hmm. It, it, for him, I'm not the one gonna call the lower rank guys up anyways. Like I'm still sitting atop, you know, in the in the top 15. I'm not gonna that for him. He, why that has he, to be a title fight. You're saying that has to be a title. That, no, it wouldn't have to be a title fight, but it it would a more organic pairing. Something something more organic, something worth more more Still, than, more than just a fight. You know what, what did I mean? what did you make of his performance? It was nice. Dude. Oh, He's I'm the, tremendous. I am. I mean, we would have to go tit for tat as to who's the bigger Rachmana fan. I think the guy's stellar. I mean, it's like. In the world chuck full of Hamzat Chmaev, like there's this guy lurking in the shadows that to me is better than he is. Like I think th- they have the same skills, but when you watch Shavkat fight, he has bulletproof composure. He might not be as funny on the microphone and have his his viral moments, but you'll you'll Gilbert Burns couldn't get him to break stature and fight reckless. Like in the, in the, in the way Hamzat fought him, like you, he should have fought a little more. Like his coach was saying to him in the corners, like, quit trying to brawl, be more technical, put the jab in his face, those types of things. Rachmanov, you could do, say or do anything, that guy is so composed. I Luke th- was I feel like the Howard a- Cassell for him, yeah. to, to Ali. Luke was day one-ish yeah. that this guy's First time coming, I saw him, right? I was like, whoa. And I'll tell you this, too. 
it doesn't matter what country you're from, yeah. if you wear dead animals on your head, <laughs> Dude, you're a different motherfucker. <laughs> he still owes me a hat, by the way. Right? Danny's on the other side of the you know, street. They, they, they say that about, about my hat. Any culture outfit, you've too, ever seen, yeah. including ones in the United States with like Native American populations, yeah. where they wear animal pelts, yeah. dude, they're, they're, that's a different level of dialed in right there. Oh, dude, for sure. Not to mention, those are authentic. That's a real, yeah. that's a real wolf on his head. It's yeah. not like, it's not like you it can was a fly, it's not like you fly that, through yeah. the airport like a coonskin cap, like, oh, this is cute. I'll just buy this little wolf hat. No, I'm my way to the United beast. States. Yeah. Like, heck no, they go out there and skin the thing out back and tie her up. It's I know he's out, he's obviously from Kazakhstan and he's with Sanford MMA. Yeah. But you guys have the same management. You ever train with him at all? I haven't, no. No, okay. I'd love to. I, l I want to train with Armand. Armand was just here in Las Vegas, and we eclipsed each other. That's another kid that's uh, Sarukian. Dude, Dude, his balance on the single leg when oh. when Gamera went, I was my I was I, I just I, my mouth hit the floor. I it's could like wrestle not. porn. It's like going for the high crotch and running that pipe. Man. Shut yeah. the fuck <laughs> up! You are the worst human on earth. <laughs> he does this all day, but in reality, dude, was that not? That was just next. I mean, it's hard to explain, but it, it was so athletic, skill based, intense. And Gamera, by the way, not relenting and finding it in the fourth and fifth rounds, like an unbelievable that, decision like that. That was just a display, and I know that's kind of been the narrative after the fight is that was really the display of like the next generation of fighting that we get to look forward to. Like that's that's what fights are gonna look like going forward. Like yeah. that was something special for anybody that's a fight fan. Just to see that display, but to that, like, it just was so dynamic. Like, everything on the ground and the exchanges was dynamic. The single leg defense was dynamic. The exchanges, everything was just kind of like a step above, almost like in a progression type of sense. Like, wow, this is the prog this is the progressive level of mixed martial arts. Like, we get to look forward to down the road. And <laughs> it's just like, dude, I, I openly said it. If I was 25, when I, when I was 25 in the UFC, and I had to fight him at 25, Fuck I'd that. get fucking thumped. Like, yeah. I would have gotten my butt kicked. Like, yeah. I did also the energy expenditure between those two at 155 pounds. You just don't see that a lot. No, I talked to a kid that trained with Gamera at Tiger, and he said that that guy is just the goer. He's the, he's the guy in the gym that just endless he's gas tank, notorious for just having good cardio. And that was... That was like next level conditioning, dude. Because everything he did was a big move. Like this, even the the entries, the takedowns are big moves. The the escapes from bottom, like Armand, oh Armand's really sticky. He's got like more of the Dagestan style, where Gamera just wants to scramble all over guys. And I'm like, how is this guy not toast? Like, he just how many back bridges did he do to get out of those positions? It's crazy. Who are like, sorry? Go ahead, BC. I was gonna say you you clearly got a lot of work to do, and and you're ready to come back. And, I'm, yeah. and I can't wait to find out yeah. who you're fighting next. But um. It, you can beat anybody on any night. You've, yeah. you've shown that flash yeah. without question. So, do you feel, you know, extra pressure right now in, the, in this in this in this comeback to your next fight? Um, the the shitty reality is I've been in this position before. I know what it's like to have to go into a fight on two losses, and it's something that it, there's no more there's no higher amount of pressure I can put on myself than what I already do. So like. It being two losses, it, it, I put the same amount of pressure on myself if I'm, if I'm, if not more than I'm, I'm, I'm on a win streak. You know, it's like, it's not like I feel like I have nothing to lose, but I've been here before. Like, it's like what Chael said before, like, in order to win, you got to know how to lose. And that's a reality. You got to know how to, like. That's brilliant, actually. Put, it really, it really is. is. You have to know how to lose. And I, and fortunately, I, I've, I've got yeah. to live that. I know how to handle this type of scenario. Max so, does that very well. So well. come fight night, you got to just put it behind you, dude. Especially if you. When you spend enough time here and you put on exciting fights, it's it, it goes a long ways. When you bring your best product, like it, that's what it's, that's the most important. And thing. I ask it to you that way because when I think of you getting back to the top, which let's be fair, you're a couple wins away. I mean, you're right there. I could be one win. I, I love your style against Usman. I just want to see what it looks like. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, do you think about that same thing when you watch him defend his title? Yeah, he's stylistically he's one of the more intriguing matchups for me for sure. Like. It's, it'd be interesting to see somebody really have to bring out the wrestler in him, like really try to f be able to get him to stay engaged with some wrestling scenarios because he's pretty springy. Like he's a guy, you get him to the floor, he's going to bounce up if you even get him there. But is the wrestler in you like, yeah, I want to see that, I want to feel that, I want to see how I do? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Those are, those are always, for me, the, the more challenging fights and the ones I run towards most. Like the Brady fight was like, fuck, this guy is supposed to be the better grappler. I always want to challenge myself against a guy that's a good wrestler or a good grappler. Like that's always... It's kind of like the style I have is the style I want to challenge myself against. I feel like it's the most, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up a lot more when I got to go. As, as a fan of the sport, who are the fighters you like, as a fan, mm -hmm. as a fan, you like just like love to watch? I'm a big Izzy guy, Saryukian guy, Rachmanov Yoana, guy. Yoana, Yoana, He's man. a Yoana guy. Um, I'm a big, I, I like Shavkat a lot, and I've been on him for, for a long time. 
Um, I do like watching Algerman Sterling fight. Um, I enjoy watching. Uh, I like watching Adrian Yanez. Yeah, that's Luke's dude, guy. Dude, dude, I just My had. I just God. interviewed him. We had a forty-five minute interview about dude, boxing and MMA. He is a. Fuck. It's that's that's impressive. Yeah. That's another one of those guys you throw in the categories with the Sarukians and the Gamrots. Like he's showing that next level of MMA that's going to be the norm. He's twenty. There's such a. It's a paradigm shift in where the sport's headed now and how it's like. Back when it started, it was like the jujitsu guys, and then it's the ground and pound guys, then it's the strikers that can wrestle, then it's the then it turns into the athletes, and we've had kind of that, we had that for a long time. The George St. Pierre is the athletes of, of the sport. Now we're starting to see the athletes that can blend the techniques at the same time, like Israel Adesanya, amazing martial artist, but he's also a fucking phenomenal athlete. Yeah. I bet he could do a very a lot of athletic things on a track field. Or you ever seen him dance? Way. Like no bullshit. Yeah, can, can, even in the way he dances, but yeah. now. We're gonna see the more extreme version of that. We're seeing that in Adrian Yanez. Dude, I, We're seeing it in Armand Saruki. Yeah. Like it's just crazy. Yanez says something to me that kind of caught my attention too, which is you think about like the guy, the, the next gen guys, his 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 generation dudes. He was telling me like how many times he encounters people, and the word he used was they're they're stupid. They're not. They don't. They can't compute the what. They don't have thoughtful offense. And the early generation of MMA has had a lot of aggro, tough as shit, some skills, no doubt about it, but now you're getting the guys who are real, like, dude, Floyd, you can say whatever you want about Floyd, S fight IQ off the charts. Oh, maybe the smartest. Astronomical, seriously. Yeah, one of the best guys with fight IQ, especially in a sport when you can, you can lean on that a lot. In MMA, and then this isn't me taking a shot at boxing, mm -hmm. but in MMA, you can't, you, can't, <laughs> you can't just lean on having really high fight IQ. It's like there's too much stuff going on. There's too many things to compute. Like, yeah, Dustin in a boxing match, a champion if that In was a boxing team. match, you could have very high... The, the, Floyd, yeah, he's, the, he's got the highest fight IQ for a boxer. I wouldn't say for a fighter, but for boxing, I think it's, that's but, an Bud Crawford's up there, too. Yeah. Bud Crawford's good. Yeah, he fights from both stances as well. You know, Michael Chiesa's is up there, too. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, working on the fight. Get the fuck out. I mean, what are you doing here? <laughs> get the hell out of here. Uh, all right. Here's one thing, though. Uh, yeah. I mentioned, uh, well, we brought it here, so let me just bring it up. You're a disgusting person. <laughs> no, I'm who looking, eats? I'm actually hungry, Who too. eats disgusting things. <laughs> what is this experiment we got going so on? So here? here's, the, here, let me explain my side of the story. So one day, I don't know how I found out you ate chocolate hummus, which is just, I just, I, I, I wouldn't hit you because you kicked my ass, <laughs> but I do want to hit you over it. <laughs> Because so, you're Lebanese too, right? My mom, my mom's from yeah, Lebanon. Okay, all right. And so here's why I want right. to pitch this to you because yeah. you are Italian, yeah. And you know, with Italian cooking, what's the secret to Italian cooking? They don't have a shitload of ingredients, no. But what they have is all high quality. Like you have the right tomatoes, yeah. the right pasta, the yeah. right salts, the right oils, and you call it a day. Mm -hmm. Why are you? <laughs> how are you another American <laughs> who is destroying the heritage of the Middle East? By putting fucking chocolate in your hummus. Well, for Explain one, yourself. I didn't put the chocolate in the hummus. This wasn't my idea. I just happened to be a Fred Meyer <laughs> passing by, and I got some pretzel chips in my cart, and my fiance, now wife, saw this chocolate hummus, and we're like, let's let's give it a go. Let me we, explain we something to you. We fucking love hummus. My, my mom, and I'm telling my mom you, passed away a long time ago, bro. Me, and you're a pro fighter. Me. And you're a pro fighter. Yeah. But if my mom was around and she saw this, she'd beat your fucking ass. <laughs> Believe that. She's going to be with those She's going to beat your ass. You know she's going to beat your ass. I'm going to make you try this. All right, I'm going to eat it. Oh, oh is, is that good? good? Yeah, it's probably like a dessert, Luke. You're going to eat your First words, of all, you don't right? even eat hummus with pretzels. Just number one, off the break, you're doing this all wrong. Just, Listen, I want to point that out. <laughs> Somebody's been watching Cooking Come with Bolt. Get, get a decent amount. That's, that's good. a decent amount, right? That's good, yeah. Sorry, Mom. Don't. Oh, God. Here I'm going to go. see you with this bag for a while. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's a lie. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is all for show. Mm. This is good. This is terrible. This is good yeah, for TV. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. Dude, I cannot swallow this. Yeah, swallow it. It's good for you. Yeah. Do you eat fucking cigarette butts and road salt? <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> it's like, Michael, what are you eating for your weight, uh, your weight cut there? Banana peels. No, chocolate hummus. This is delicious. Oh, my God, dude. That I is, highly recommend this. That is so fucking gross. Let me wash it down with my bang energy drink. <laughs> wow. and, my, and my refined palate. <laughs> that's, that's really bad. I want you to know that. It's really fucking bad. No, it's, Look, it's like the dessert. It's just like... It's delicious. Michael, I got to tell you, you're one of a kind, dude. You're a great asset to the sport. You're a funny dude. You're a smart dude. Take care of your brain. I mean I that quite sincerely. Yeah. Um, because you're using it to great effect. Thank you, sir. And um, I don't. When do, when do you think you might be back? For me, I think early fall would probably be the most realistic. I got to make sure I just, like I said, when it comes to my body at this point, I got to dot my I's and cross my T's. I got to make a real run at this, and, and I, I could shorten that by not making sure that I take care of so this. So like third, fourth quarter of this year, think about coming back? Third, fourth quarter, yeah. 
Well, we can't wait to see it, man. I we're really glad you stopped by. There, baby. You were on the short list when we <laughs> thought of this whole concept. Yeah. And, uh, get I, this man a drug rug already. I mean, <laughs> yeah, on, get this man on. a drug rug. Round of applause for Michael Kies, everybody. Mm. There he is. <laughs> UFC welterweight, <laughs> UFC analyst. Uh, anything and, you want, anything and, you want to plug? And complete degenerate, don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go, anything you want to plug? Uh, no, just shout out to my fans, my family. And I always give Danny a shout out, not just because he's sitting on the other side. Okay. Uh, the also, we gave Danny a ton of shit. He's a great manager. Yeah, he's one of the one few of the reasonable the people in the sport. And uh, I, honestly, your success is not accidental either. Yeah. Well, it's somewhat accidental, but that's, you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all I got. But thanks, guys. This was great. Hope to do it again. Well, there you go. Room Service Diaries. We're out. Peace. Bitch. <laughs>